Mr. Speaker, from AIG. We're so glad he's here, but we do want to, to let's stand together and pray and ask God that the information we get today will, in fact, uh, help us. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege of being back in chapel on this Wednesday. We thank you for the special guest you send from time to time, and we thank you for our friend from Creation Ministries International that's with us today. We pray that you will enable him to share what needs to be said today, and you will enable us to receive and listen and hear what he has to say. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Dr. Burke. We're delighted to have with us today Dr. Jonathan Sarfati from Creation Ministries International. Creation.com is their website, so you can look that up during the <laughs> service here. Dr. Sarfati was born in Australia, grew up and studied in New Zealand, where he acquired a PhD in chemistry. He returned to Australia in 1996 to work as a research scientist and editorial consultant for Creation Ministries International. 2010, Dr. Sarfati immigrated to the U.S. with his wife to work in the CMI USA office as author, speaker, apologist, and head scientist. He has made a significant impact through his prolific writings. Let me give you an idea of what he has done. He, is, he has authored papers in mainstream scientific journals. He is co-editor of Creation Magazine, also writes for a scholarly, peer-reviewed publication for CMI. His book, Refuting Evolution, has close to a half a million copies in print. In 2004, he wrote Refuting Compromise, which has been acclaimed as the most powerful biblical and scientific defense of a straightforward view of Genesis creation ever written. In 2010, Dr. Sarfati wrote The Greatest Hoax on Earth, Refuting Dawkins on Evolution. In 2015, Dr. Sarfati probably wrote his most important and comprehensive book, The Genesis Account, a theological, historical, and scientific commentary on Genesis 1 through 11, almost 800 pages long. Dr. Sarfati is also a master chess player. He is a former New Zealand chess champion, and he rarely accepts challenges to play multiple people at once blindfolded. Join me in welcoming Dr. Jonathan Sarfati as the speaker of the day. Well, thank you for coming out uh, to hear me. And I, I guess you know by now I don't come from this country, right? So here is where I come from. Now, I've moved over here because we have two little granddaughters who live in Florida. Now, another thing, uh, I'm actually ethnically Jewish. My name is the Hebrew word for Frenchman, so I can tell Jewish jokes, I guess, and get away with it. Uh, why a Jew like me would believe in Jesus or Yeshua? Well, one reason is that he fulfilled many prophecies of the Hebrew Bible in his first coming, the Old Testament. And some of those prophecies have an expiration date on them. Uh, but, of course, a lot of my work nowadays is dealing with this man. You might say that Darwin is the prophet of the religion of the government schools in the West. I mean, the ACLU claimed they got rid of religion from the schools. No, they didn't. They got rid of Christianity. But they, did, they replaced it with a religion of evolutionary humanism, which says everything made itself. There's no need for uh, God to tell us right from wrong. Now, one thing we, we offer Creation Ministry is our free website, creation.com, and you better take some notes about this. And one thing to help is actually we have a free email newsletter uh, called the InfoBytes, and this actually is updated every day. Uh, it shows you some classic articles in the archives, creation speakers in the area, like for instance, um, the gravitational wave discovery. We had an article by a cosmologist from a creation perspective on that. Uh, you may have heard recently that um, some Chinese authors wrote a paper on the, the human hand and said, this is what the creator did, and there's a huge outcry. How dare you mention a creator in a scientific journal? Never mind that the founders of modern science were biblical creationists. They believe that we have a divine lawmaker who upholds the creation in a regular way. This was the foundation of modern science, and now supposedly uh, people like Isaac Newton are not scientific. 
even though he wrote more about the Bible than he wrote about science. Now, what we actually have here is a free email newsletter, as I said. We won't spam you or sell your address to any third party, um, but it comes out about once a week, and this is one way to keep in touch. So you guys want to hand around this sign-up sheet? Thanks, guys. Now, there might be some time for question time for some of those who don't have uh, later classes. I'm happy to stay around and ask, answer questions. But meanwhile, I want to ask you a question. What was Jesus' first miraculous act recorded in the Gospels? Water Everyone says that. I don't think it's right, though. So water into wine was John chapter 2. It was said to be the first uh, sign to the disciples in his earthly ministry. So you see, it's qualified. But in fact, even before he was born, he did other miracles. Because we see, going back a chapter to John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, he was with God in the beginning. Well, who is the Word here? Uh, it's Jesus. And it tells us, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. So you see, even before he was born, he was the creator of the universe. Now this is important. John wrote his gospel so people might believe in Jesus, have eternal life, and yet he starts off showing Jesus is God and creator. And this is what Darwin does. It attacks the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, and this is important that Jesus is God because we see God speaking through various prophets. I think you guys in America call him Isaiah, don't you? See, Australians call him Isaiah, okay? And they're both wrong because in Hebrew it's Yeshayahu. Okay, so God spoke through to Yeshayahu and said, I, I am the Lord, which is Jehovah or Yahweh, and apart from me there is no Savior. So you see, for Jesus to be Savior, he must be Jehovah God himself and not a created being like the cults teach. But he's also fully man. He's a mediator between God and man, which means he needs to be both God and man. And this is foretold by the same prophet. The Redeemer will come to Zion to those in Jacob who repent of their sins. Now the Hebrew Goel means kinsman redeemer. And it's translated this way in the book of Ruth, who is one of Jesus' ancestors. And the point of the kinsman redeemer is revealed, that he's related by blood to those whom he redeems. So if Jesus is our kinsman redeemer, he must be our blood relative. Well, how can this be? Well, we see in the Gospels we have the genealogies, the ancestry lines of Jesus in the Gospel. Now, as you see, look at Abraham. See, Matthew's Gospel was written to Jewish readers, first of all. And therefore, he starts off with Jesus as uh, from the first Jew, Abraham. See Abraham here? And then traces it to through the kings of Israel through down here. And notice up here, I've got Joseph. And there's a dotted line here because Joseph wasn't the biological father. Because Jesus was virgin born. Now Luke's gospels are different because he's tracing, he's tracing Mary's line. And therefore Luke goes backwards through Mary and traces Mary from a son of Nathan, David called Nathan. And then goes to Abraham. But Luke was writing to Gentile people, not to Jewish. So he doesn't stop at Abraham. He goes to where Abraham came from, as revealed in Genesis. Abraham was the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, and so on and so on, until we get the son of Noah. And then to the son of Adam, who is called the son of God and not the son of an ape. So you see, you can't mix evolution and the Gospels. The Gospels treat Adam as a real historical figure who was a direct creation of God and an ancestor of Jesus Christ and the ancestor of everyone else on earth who has ever lived. It's because Adam is our common ancestor that Jesus can be our kinsman redeemer. No matter what race or people group or skin shade you have, you come from Adam and therefore can be saved through Jesus the redeemer kinsman redeemer and this is why we send missionaries overseas because everyone on earth comes from adam and needs the kinsman redeemer throw out a historical adam you throw out the kinsman redeemer idea and you throw out a why do we bother with missionary work in fact back in australia uh, darwin's allies in the church of england said don't bother preaching the gospel to the aboriginals in australia because they're not evolved enough to understand it so it's not exactly a side issue now, if Jesus is God, it means everything he says must be true, right? And he said things like scripture cannot be broken. So is Genesis part of scripture? So can Genesis be broken? And you know how he would say it is written? He would quote scripture. And for Jesus, what scripture said is what God said. And you know what the word Bible stands for? 
basic instructions before leaving earth. And the Bible is, a, is, in fact, a book of history. Even the doctrine and the morals of the Bible are grounded in the history of the Bible. For instance, marriage under attack in the Western world. But when Jesus was asked about marriage, he goes back to where marriage began. From the beginning of creation, God made the male and female. For this reason, the man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, the two will become one flesh. So what's he quoting from here? From the very first two chapters of Genesis. And he's quoting about the same man and woman. So um, there are certain people who say that Jesus said nothing about gay marriage, but of course they go to liberal theological cemeteries, I mean seminaries. Uh, but as you see here, he says that marriage is defined as a man and a woman, because this is God's idea. Right from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. This is the only type of marriage Jesus recognized, because God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And we see a man leaves his father and mother because the first man, Adam, had no father and mother, uh, to become one flesh because Eve was taken from Adam's flesh. So when you have the history of marriage, the doctrine makes perfect sense. Abandon this history, and then the doctrine of marriage no longer has a leg to stand on. And by the way, just a bit of science for you, the rib is the one bone in the body that will grow back. So we see that modern surgery has caught up with the Bible to some extent um, because God knew what he was doing to take the rib out. Adam didn't have to spend his whole uh, life with a, mis a hole in his chest. Now there are people around who, who tell me that I shouldn't worry about Genesis, I should just preach the gospel. Okay, well let's follow the example of the greatest gospel preacher in history, the Apostle Paul. Is that reasonable, I hope? So how did Paul preach the gospel? That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You see how the gospels don't dangle rootlessly in a vacuum. They depend on the, the truth revealed in the scriptures. Well, what scriptures are we talking about? You see, the gospel means good news, but you can't understand good news until you have bad news. See, why do we need to say this? Because we are sinners. And Paul goes on to explain where sin came from. For as by a man came death, by man has come the, also the resurrection of the death. For as an animal dies, so in Christ will all be made alive. So we see Paul's gospel message went back to where sin came from. Our ancestor Adam, who committed a real sin and was punished with physical death. You were made from dust, now you're going to return to dust. That's physical death. And that's why Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, uh, came to die for sin. Because death is the punishment for sin. And uh, the last thing he said on the cross was, uh, it is finished, which in Greek is one word, tetelestai. And that was written on bills in those days to say paid in full. We have records of that. You see, so Jesus' death paid in full for every sin a believer will commit. It's nailed to that cross. But that wasn't the end of it because on the third day he rose physically from the dead. The tomb was empty. There was no body there. He appeared to 500 people at once to prove he was who he said he was. And that God had accepted that sacrifice. So you see how the gospel message is all about the bodily resurrection of Jesus as the first fruits. So the bodily resurrection of believers as well is going to come. But that's connected to the bodily death of Jesus Christ and the bodily death of Adam because of sin. So you see this connection that Paul makes with Adam's sin and the death that came through it. And he even called Jesus the last Adam. And again, he quotes from Genesis, the first man, Adam, became a living being. He was made from the dust. You see, in Genesis 2, we have God making Adam from the dust of the ground. And in Hebrew, there's a word play there. Adama is the ground. So Adam was made from the Adama. So I think Hebrew was for the first language or something very like it because these word plays make so much sense in Hebrew and not in other languages. And the first non-Hebrew names we see are in Genesis 14 after the Tower of Babel and the confusion of languages. And we even see Paul alluding to Genesis 1 because of different kinds of things. He's talking about the events of day three of creation, the plants, the different kinds of seeds. Now notice Genesis says things reproduce after their kind, not one thing evolving into kind evolving into another kind. 
And then uh, different kinds of flesh for humans and for animals. He's quoting Genesis 1 again, day 5 and day 6. Then he's quoting Genesis um, day 4 of creation, the different kinds of bodies for the sun, moon, and stars. So you see, Paul's gospel message, as you see, uh, quoted the first three chapters of Genesis. <clears throat> And furthermore, he expected his readers to have been familiar with Genesis. So it means they must have been discipled in the book of Genesis in the early church. So Paul didn't have to explain what he was talking about. He expected them to know that he's referring to Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And this is very important to explain things like why we have death in the world. Well, Paul explains death is not the way God made it. Is because of Adam's sin. Blame sin for death. Don't blame God for putting death there in the first place. Now, evolution says the opposite. It says that death brought man. Now, if you don't believe me, let's see what Darwin himself said. The war of nature from famine and death. That's where humans came from. And you can't get these more diametrically opposed pictures than this. The Bible says man brought death. Evolution says death brought man. That is the key reason why evolution doesn't match with the Bible. And in fact, even millions of years has a huge problem, often overlooked. You see, this is the Garden of Eden. Now, in Genesis 1, God says that things were good seven times, and seven is a number of biblical perfection. The seventh time he said it was very good. Now, a millions of years view came about because people uh, didn't want to believe in a global flood because a global flood means God judges sin. So they believed the rock layers formed slowly and gradually over millions of years. So that means this garden of Eden must be on all these rock layers. But the problem is those rock layers contain fossils. Now, this would mean then, if millions of years are true, this very good garden of Eden is on this pile of bones miles deep. That's a logical outcome. The bones mean dead things, but the bones mean diseases too because we have gout, uh, osteoporosis, and bone cancer in the fossil record. And supposedly God, God is then calling bone cancer very good. What do you call very bad if bone cancer is very good? But you see, this is the logical outcome of the millions of years. You're calling death and suffering and disease very good because it's all in the fossil record. And see how many parts of the Bible you have to contradict uh, to do this. Death is called the last enemy, not the way God made it. We have in Romans 5 this famous contrast between Adam and Jesus. Sin came through one man, death through sin, so death spread to all men. You see, death comes because of sin. And we have the wage of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Over and over again, we are seeing death as a result of sin. But you see, this is why, um, if you believe in evolution, you are having to chop out so many parts of Scripture. And that's the wrong way around, because surely the Bible's God's Word. I mean, there are people who tell me that, that the Bible's not a scientific textbook, and I tell them, thank goodness, because textbooks always go out of date. So how about we let science catch up with God's Word? instead of trying to tell God what he really meant to say. And this has problems even for the rest of creation because we have the, Adam having dominion, Adam and Eve were given dominion over creation, so when they fell, everything else fell underneath them. And that includes the change of diet. Animals and humans were given green plants for food. Now, it's not a sin to eat meat now because God allowed us to eat meat after the flood. And if you look in Genesis 9, he says, as I gave you the green plants, now I'm giving you meat. Jesus ate meat. He ate the parts of a lamb. He ate fish after the resurrection. Jesus could not sin, and therefore it's not sinful to eat meat. And one reason is that God cursed the ground when Adam sinned. And that's why plants were no longer as nutritious and couldn't satisfy the dietary needs of humans and animals anymore. And broccoli is proof of the curse. <laughs> in fact, we, uh, back in Australia, I think we've got proof of it too. Thanks very much. Well, the Australian Tourist Commission has asked us to come up with a song that we could perform overseas, a song to help bring the tourists back to Australia. That's right, so we focused on the wonderful wildlife and the fabulous fauna that Australia has to offer. Red back funnel with blue ringed octopus, taipan, tiger snake, and a box jellyfish, stonefish, and the poison thing that lives in a shell, the spicy when you pick it up. 
come to Australia, you might accidentally get killed. <laughs> Your life's constantly under threat. Have you been bitten yet? You've only got three minutes left before a massive coronary breakdown. Red back funnel with blue ring, octopus, taipan, tiger snake, adder box, jellyfish, big shark. Just waiting for you to go swimming at Bondi Beach. Come on, come to Australia. You might accidentally get killed. Your blood is bound to be spilled. With fear, your pants will be filled. Because you might accidentally get killed. Okay, so if uh, the fossils came after Adam Sin, what do you think could have caused them? Well, here's a clue, three whole chapters of Genesis, and we see that Jesus affirmed the flood was real, the ark was real, Noah was real, you see. So if Jesus believed the flood, then so should we. But let's see what the evolutionists say, what the, the textbooks say. This is from an Australian high school biology book. It's how a, a fossil forms, supposedly. Now, what we have here is the fishy is swimming along the ocean, uh, it's swimming along, and then it dies, it sinks to the bottom. I mean, you see over millions of years how the mountains are being eroded away, washing silt into the ocean and burying that fish over millions of years. This is the textbook view. But let's do some real science, you know, observation, experiment. Repetition, testing, okay. What happens to a fish when, it's dead, when it dies? It floats, doesn't it? I mean, those of you who keep fish have an aquarium. Uh, where do you have to scoop the dead fish out? From the top or from the bottom? Yeah, so obviously we know right away that that picture in the textbook is nonsense. This picture says the fish sink, but we know that they don't, they, don't, they float. So you don't need, you don't need to be a PhD scientist to refute evolution. Just simple things like fish floating. You're not going to get a fossil this way. And of course, floating dead fish, they will rot and they will be eaten by other things. You're not going to get a fossil this way. If you don't believe me, go scuba diving and find me some fossilizing dead fish. So here's a better idea. Again, we start with the fishy, but this time you have the flood erupting. And the Bible tells you the first cause of the flood was in the oceans, the great deep, the rainfall was a secondary thing. And of course, the, the, this is going to be huge underwater eruptions causing gigantic underwater mud flows that bury these fish and it hasn't got a chance to escape. But now the scavengers can't get to it. Now the soft parts disappear uh, sometimes, not always, but the hard parts are replaced by the minerals. And the minerals in the mud replace the bone, turn it into stone. And that's how you get fossils. It has to be done this way. It has to be done quickly. I'll show you why. Here's some examples of fossils. This, this comes from our Creation magazine. And I hope you guys got the blue sheet uh, up on top of the pile here. Of those piles. The blue sheet should be on top now. Yeah, I'll need to talk about that. There's some blue sheets under the white sheets, and they, the blue sheets need to be on top now. Yeah, just so. No, 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 not pass them. I'm just saying they have to be on top, that's all. Don't pass them yet. I'm just saying they have to be on top. Okay, now, now what I'm talking about here is here's an example of something which is in our creation magazine. No, don't pass them, please. Don't pass them. I'm just getting you ready for them. Now, this is actually a, an ichthyosaur, a reptile version of a dolphin. And why I say it's a mother ichthyosaur is because look here, she's giving birth. And was this thing lying on the ocean floor for millions of years, slowly giving birth? <laughs> I've had a, heard of long, difficult labour, but rarely. I mean, or I mean, those are, some of you seem to keep, have aquariums and fish tanks. Now, when you feed fish, do they eat quickly or slowly? Quick or slow? I think quick. So, what do you think of this picture here? In the middle of his lunch, I imagine you go to McDonald's for your cholesterol burger, I mean, you go chomping and suddenly you're, you're fossilized in this position. See how quickly this must have happened. Over and over again, we're getting these uh, very rapidly formed fossils. And then we find fossils are like this on the land, fighting dinosaurs. Again, had to have happened really quickly. 
Now, I want to just have a break from some of the science here and just go to why I do these sorts of ministries, uh, talks here. And one of them is that we have Jesus saying to Nicodemus, if I've told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? You see, if we don't believe the Bible on earthly things, a creation in six days, a global flood, how can we trust the Bible on heavenly things? Like Jesus is the son of God and marriage as a man and a woman. And yet we're supposed to give reasons, uh, to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give the reason for the hope that is in you. The word apologia is where we get the word apologetics from, the defense, logical defense of Christian truth claims and refutation of anti-Christian claims. And Jesus himself said the greatest command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind. Don't forget the mind part. There's nothing in the Bible about turning your brain off to be a Christian. Now, we are actually an equipping ministry. I mean, uh, that's why we have the books and the DVDs. We're trying to equip the church and the family with reason we can trust the Bible and to take it away. And one thing, we just know you're not going to remember most of what I told you tonight, today. Uh, that's why we have these books and DVDs. Now, let's face it, you have all these questions that come up. I mean, um, if God made everything, who made God? And how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible when they died out millions of years ago? And what about carbon-14? How do you get different races from Adam and Eve? And where did Cain get his wife when he wasn't able? <laughs> and these are found in this book here called the Creation Answers Book. And we're actually offering this half price to the students here. So this is a half the mark price for this book. It answers a load of questions. In fact, when I do Q&A times, most of the questions that come up are in this book. Another book you might like is called Christianity for Skeptics. It's sort of general apologetics, not just about the creation issue, but how do we answer Islam and, and Hinduism and atheism? And why do we trust the Bible as God's word? Now, I want, to, I want to talk about design of things. It's one of my own favorite topics, but I want to show why this matters for the gospel, who Jesus is, how Paul preached the gospel, how if you have millions of years, you're putting death before sin. And therefore, if death is not the result of sin, how could Jesus' death pay for our sin? So there's a problem there. But it's interesting, when you go to design of things, so here is uh, one of the world's leading evolutionists and atheists, Richard Dawkins from Oxford University, used to be anyway, retired now. Um, but he had to admit, biology is a study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Maybe it's because they were designed for a purpose. The Apostle Paul thought so. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. So Dawkins and Darwin have no excuse for their unbelief because everything is so plain from what's been made. Now, we make things ourselves. This aeroplane. So how do we know the aeroplane was designed? Well, for one thing, it has loads of correct components. But you realize an aeroplane is made up 100% of non-flying parts. So how do I ever get back to Australia then? Well, the answer is they are organized correctly. And when you have correct organization, you know there is an organizer. I mean, what's the alternative? Did a, uh, a tornado go through a junkyard and put the parts together in the right way to make a jet plane? Actually, what would happen if a tornado hit the jet plane? It would turn it into a junkyard, maybe. So what is going on here? Why is that? Well, a very simple principle here, actually, is there are many more ways of being a junkyard than being a jet plane. So when you add the energy, undirected energy, all you do is go to the more probable state, which is the junkyard. Now compare this to living things. Living things are enormously more complicated because they can make copies of themselves. I mean, your kids basically are copies of you, and your body is made up of 100 trillion cells, and your cells are copying themselves, which is how your body grows and repairs itself. There's nothing we can do uh, that can copy itself. I mean, uh, jet planes don't have little jet planes. <laughs> uh, the Boeing factory makes you jet planes, but it won't make you another factory. A photocopy will copy documents, but it won't give you another photocopier. So you see, the point is, living things are enormously more complicated. So how did they get there? Well, again, evolutionists have the idea that if you have a flow of energy through some sort of primordial soup, you might get 
uh, living things organize themselves into a living thing. But again, I'll test this idea. A frog into a blender. Now when I turn the switch on, I'm adding energy, right? So what's the result? It's a frog smoothie, okay? And again, the principle here is there are many more ways of being a frog smoothie than being a frog. And by the way, no real frog was harmed in the making of my talk, okay? <laughs> I was saying that, that raw energy doesn't help. I mean, could you leave us going for millions of years and think a frog's going to hop out of there again? It's not going to happen, is it? You see, no matter how much time or energy you have, if you haven't got the organization, you're not going to get the living thing there. In fact, not even any germ is going to grow in there. There's no bacteria. Uh, you could can this and sterilize and seal it, and it's safe to eat because no germ will form there to give you food poisoning. Now, evolution says life came from non-living chemicals. You've got the ideal test for that. You've got the, all the chemicals you want, all the energy you want, all the time you want, and yet no bacteria are going to grow in canned food. Um, the only way you get contamination is if the seal was broken and it came from outside. But it doesn't come from inside. And it applies to canned sardines, canned Georgia peaches, what have you, okay? The same principle. Canned food is a test of evolution, and it fails. And when you look at how complex living things are, I think you'll see what I'm talking about because living things have energy, loads of energy. And in the cell, the energy is in the form of ATP. That's the, the, what our cell uses for energy. And the thing is, it's so important that your body makes its own weight in ATP every day and consumes it. Cyanide kills you by stopping the stuff being made, but now we know it's made by the tiniest motor in the universe. This animated sequence shows the ATP synthase enzyme in operation. The animation is based on an incredible series of scientific discoveries. Only the colors show artistic license. ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is the energy currency of the cell. ATP is produced by a tiny molecular rotary motor, rotating it up to 7,000 RPM. These are so small that 100,000 would fit side by side in a millimeter. A current of protons drives the motor, unlike man-made electric motors which use electrons. This portion of the enzyme is where adenosine diphosphate is combined with a phosphate ion in the presence of a catalyst to produce ATP, which is then released, making way for the next cycle. A top view of the enzyme shows the sequential operation. Almost every biochemical process in your body requires ATP. Such a nanomachine exhibits all the characteristics of super-intelligent design. ATP is vital for life, and many of these motors were needed before the first living cell could exist. An evolutionary impossibility. Now, so we have amazing amounts of machines, nano-robotic technology to make living things. We have to have these machines. Darwin didn't have a clue about these machines, by the way. Now, going back to the jet plane, you know what would really clinch a design is if we found the instruction manual in the glove compartment. And this is actually what we have. We have the instruction manual, the famous DNA molecule. And this is a message molecule that has the instructions to build who you are. In fact, the simplest living thing has about 600 kilobytes of information, but it must be incredibly compressed because it takes over 100 computers running for 10 hours um, to do what the cell does, the simplest cell does. But we actually have uh, 5,000 times as much. We have about three gigabytes of information. Again, incredibly compressed. And that's the equivalent. If the information in each of our cells and the DNA was written out, it would take about 1,000 Bible-sized books to write it out. But only 200 times the size of the IRS tax code. And the books are written in ink 
on paper. The thing is, the ink didn't organize itself into a book. You didn't pour ink on a page and get a book. You have to organize the ink. It required an author to make the book. In the same way, there's nothing in the chemistry of the, of the DNA to make it write messages. Once again, we have a message. It requires a sender. A book requires an author. Programs require a programmer. And this is what we have. And we also have a language for a book. But in fact, DNA has multiple languages on the same part of the DNA. So imagine a book you could read in English and in German and could read backwards. That's more like what we have with DNA. Now, it's interesting that you have, this is a key issue. The idea of information is a key issue to understand why evolution doesn't work. And this is the problem that even evolutionists are admitting, that most of the workings of a cell are best described, not in terms of material stuff, hardware, but it's information or software. And the key point here is, how did stupid atoms spontaneously write their own software? Nobody knows. And that is a key problem, that where does the information come from? And then when we look at evolution, what evolution's all about. You see, what I've shown you so far is necessary even for the simplest life. But this is what the evolutionary theory is really about. It said that all living things evolved from a single cell creature that came from a primordial soup. So you could call it from goo to you via the zoo. And that requires information to go uphill. This is the key point. Evolution requires new genes and new information. The primordial soup has zero information. And the simplest cell has 600 kilobytes. We have three gigabytes. So it means for to go from a single cell to a human being, you have to multiply this information. You've got to increase it. But do we actually see this? I know there's an article recently which is totally misrepresenting what creationists have always taught. And this is what I've been teaching uh, for uh, almost 20 years, okay? Now, I'll show you what actually happens with, with what people think is evolution, but it's not. So I'm going to start off and give you an example which Darwin used. Here's a generic sort of pair of dogs. And what I have on the outside is a medium length of fur. I think probably God created fairly generic creatures with lots of variation. What I've got here, why this thing has a medium fur is because on the left side of the belly, this is actually meant to be a gene, a part of your DNA that has instructions to make short fur. On the right side is the gene for long fur. You have them together and you're going to have medium fur. Now, one thing to remember is that we actually have information in pairs, one half from your mother, one half from your father. And when you marry and have kids, you pass on one half, your spouse passes on the other half, so your kids look like both of you. So, what happens when these dogs marry and have pups? Well, they both could pass on a short fur gene. And a lot, most of the pups, at least half the pups, will actually have one of each, like their parents. So medium fur. Now, what happens if they pass on a long fur bo from both parents? What's it going to look like? <laughs> See, what I've got here, I'm showing you why she goes on. And this is how you get lots of, of different varieties from a, few, a relatively few number of animals, land vertebrates on the ark. I mean, Noah had to only take land vertebrate animals. So you only need to rescue marine creatures from a flood. But see, God pre-programmed them with a lot of genetic variations so that their offspring could have loads of variety and adapt to different environments. So the variation was already pre-programmed. And that's what creationists have realized even before Darwin. They didn't understand genetics, but they, they knew that God must have programmed some variation into the original created kinds, which also went on the ark. See, what I've got here, you see, Darwin looked at this and said, well, hang on, you, got, you started off with medium fur, but now you've got a long fur and you've got a short fur variety. But when you look at genetics, you see there's nothing new there. The information was already pre-programmed into them. But the genetics was discovered by a creationist, Gregor Mendel, and Darwin ignored Mendel. So we see there's nothing new there. There's no new information. There's no more variety, but the information was pre-programmed. This is what the critics of creation don't understand, and this is what we have always taught. 
Now let's go to uh, why this also is relevant to how we got different races or people groups. Because again, it's important to understand there's not really different skin colors. They're really different shades of one color or one hue, if you like. Uh, we have a, I'm not really a white person, okay? I'm a light brown person, actually. And black people are not really black, they're really dark brown. We actually have the same stuff. I don't have very much of it. Some people have intermediate amounts of it, some people have a lot of it. But it's all the same stuff, it's all the same uh, pigment. So I think Adam and Eve must have had quite dark skin, probably a medium complexion, because that way, if Adam and Eve could have had the capital letters, you see the capital letters there are meant to be genes for lots of melanin or dark skin. And small letters mean genes for a little bit, so light skin. So you have them both, you're going to have a medium olive type complexion. So I think Adam and Eve had an olive complexion. They were not white people. So you see here, in one generation, they could both pass on all their, their um, light skin genes and their son on the left would have light skin. And they could pass on all the dark skin genes to their daughter who are on the right and the people in between have, have different skin shades again. But again, it's because Adam and Eve had the variation pre-programmed into them and all we've done is sort them out into different populations. So one generation is all you need to get the different skin shades we see today. And it happens even now. Are these two girls are twins? Because their parents were basically a biracial couple. They both had a white English mother and a black Jamaican father, which is really light brown and dark brown, you see. So basically, the parents were a bit like Adam and Eve, had the variation put back into them they had white parents and a black parent. You see, they had the variation put back into them. And then you see the two little girls. One's blonde hair, blue, blue eye, blonde, blue eyed, fair hair. The other's dark hair, dark eye, dark skin. You see, but these are twin girls. And they're still uh, pretty looking girls, about seven or eight years old now. So this again shows how you could have different uh, people groups coming from Adam and Eve. Now, going back to this picture here, imagine what would happen if these guys went through the Ice Age, which probably happened after the Flood. Who's going to do better in the Ice Age? It'll be the, the, look, what happens? All the, the ones without the, the protection of the long fur are going to die of, of exposure. So only the long fur ones can leave offspring. The rest are eliminated. The only one, the long-fur dogs can only pass on long-fur genes. So you see, the next generation has only long fur here. So you see, um, now we've got nothing but long fur. See, this is actually natural selection in action. See, natural selection is nothing to be afraid of. Creationists thought of it before Darwin. But what's natural selection actually doing here? It's a culling force. It's not a creative force. It is removing the genes for short fur. So even if this happened for millions of years, all you are doing is taking out information. Evolution requires the new genes and new information. So natural selection is going in the opposite direction from what evolution requires. So this is no answer. So natural selection, yes, but evolution, no. So the only game evolutionists have in town is mutation. Now mutation is a typo. Now, why do you think your word processors have typo correction software? You don't really think you could get a better assignment, Mark, if you have um, some typos in your, in your um, report, do you? Now, the point is, again, there are many more ways of making something worse than making something better. So here's an example of a typo. Now, human breeders might like to breed these things, but it's still downhill as far as the doggy is concerned. Or this one, TNR, standing for totally naked rooster. Now, Chick-fil-A would love this because no need to pluck it, but it's, it's no good for the rooster because it freezes in winter and fries in summer, so the mutation has destroyed something. It has not gone something uphill. It has actually made things worse. And this is supposed to be the engine of evolution is mutations which are corrupting things. So just to summarize what I've been talking about here is that the 
a whole idea of evolution, the good to you picture, requires information to go uphill. But all we see is sorting out what's already been pre-programmed in, or we have natural selection culling information, and then we have mutation that corrupts information. So where does the new information come from? This is a key question for evolutionists. So let's see how they answer this. Professor Dawkins, can you give an example of a genetic mutation or an evolutionary process which can be seen to increase the information in the genome? So as you see, you couldn't answer the question. Here's something also that he said. Evolution has been observed. It's just that it hasn't been observed while it's happening. <laughs> and here is the, the issue. He said Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. He, said he needs evolution as a crutch for his atheistic faith. That's why he fights creationists so hard. Because if creation is true, it means he's accountable to his maker. He doesn't want that. So what are we supposed to do about that? Well, um, the Apostle Paul said we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. See, we are a Christian ministry. We are actually pointing to Jesus as the creator, not just any old designer or, or bashing evolution. We want to point people to Jesus Christ. That's the thing. And one way we have to do this is our famous creation magazine that goes to 100 countries, been going for 38 years now. And this is the best witnessing tool we've had. You see, we have, uh, we, here's one example of a person who was given creation magazine by someone and uh, is, a, is a young mother who in, encouraged me as a believer in Christ to teach my children the truth of creation and to witness to my unbelieving friends. There's a family magazine as well as a magazine to equip the Christians. There's really nothing better because it comes out uh, quarterly. And just to make it as easy as possible for you, I've done my main talk and we have now some sign-up sheets that will come around uh, eventually. We can find the slide for it. These ones here. You see, notice here, we actually have these sign-up sheets. We've made it as easy as possible because name and address is all you need to do. We have to have your address so we can send it to you, obviously. But you see, on the right side, we have the matching coupon number. That coupon on the right, uh, it matches on, on the left. So if we see the coupon, uh, we'll know who subscribed to it. You see, so don't, don't go away with it. Please uh, give it to the lovely ladies who are helping at the book table. Don't go away with the coupon. Um, now, if see, just hand the, put your name in there and take this to give, receive your gifts, okay? And the gifts we're talking about are quite nice for, for this sort of thing because if you pay for one year, you get a free back issue. So, um, it's a real Jewish bargain there. You're getting five for the price of four. And pay for three uh, years, you get a back issue plus two free DVDs. So go ahead and pass. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for, uh, for passing those around, guys. And just a few more things that we have. Just a, Here's an example of how colorful it is. And here's one of the articles that we like to talk about is how dating methods work. And this is not about how boys meet girls. This is about how old things are, okay? And there are other things we have. Every issue has an interview with a Bible-believing scientist because you, you, you get told there aren't any real scientists who believe the Bible. Well, here's an example of a, of a PhD geologist who does believe the Bible. And one thing is my own favorite thing is, that, is how humans are copying God's designs in nature. They're seeing that God had it right all along. And it has several pages for the kids too. So you've got kids or grandkids, it's a good gift subscription for them too because they can look at the four pages for the younger kids. Now other things that we have is this for the kids too. Five uh, hardcover, full color. In fact, actually it's $29, I've got the wrong price there, sorry. Keep on, I go to different countries and different, if that's the right price, I go to different countries and different currencies, you see. So I travel around the world. I just come from uh, ministry in Australia and New Zealand. I'm going to uh, probably Canada and the UK. This is where we have all the offices. And one of the things we have is also evolution's Achilles heel. If you want the most up-to-date thing for the scientists, for science, there are nine PhD scientists who've written evolution's Achilles heels, and there are 15 uh, PhD scientists who contributed to this documentary. 
So thank you very much for listening to me. I mean, as I say, the people who haven't got a class, I'm willing to stay back and answer some questions, but I'll hand it back to Dr. Bird here to uh, close off. Let's give him a hand. Thank you.